Botel, Game 16 Media, and moving on through all 32 teams, as we've mentioned before, and we're going to spend some time on the Browns. And the Browns are an team uh, for a lot of reasons, right? They've had a very interesting offseason. Their general manager is Andrew Berry, who's one of the youngest and obviously one of the blackest uh, general managers in the uh, NFL. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the things I think make him different and special. And the way he's perceived and what is said about him often reveals more about the emotions and perceptions of the commentator than it does about his actual performance or any objective reality. He's yet another GM that I scouted as a college prospect. Another feel old moment for me. He was a fringe pro prospect in his days as a corner at uh, Harvard. He played four years. It was all Ivy three times. He got his bachelor's degree in economics and then bachelor of master's in computer science. He was a scouting assistant with the Colts and was there for a couple of years. And while he was there, uh, they won four AFC titles. Sorry, yeah, four AFC titles, five South titles, five postseason appearances, and made it to the Super Bowl. Uh, 2000, after being an assistant in 09 and 10, in 2011, he became a, a full fledged scout, was a pro scouting coordinator from 2012 to 2015, and then came to the Browns in 2016 as a vice president of player personnel. Then went to the Eagles for just a very short time as their vice president of player operation, football operations. Came back to the Browns, and of course, at 33, became the youngest GM in the NFL, and one of the youngest really in the history of the NFL. Once he was there, uh, a lot happened, right? Uh, they've since, in the last uh, few months, they've acquired Amari Cooper, uh, shed a bunch of draft picks. They made the most consequential and the most controversial signing of the offseason, and bringing in Deshaun Watson. So he's clearly unafraid of risk. In fact, in fact, he clearly likes numbers. He likes probability. He plays sort of within the constraints of probability, but within those constraints, he's willing to take risks, if that makes sense. And I don't think it's a, a coincidence that uh, three of the youngest players, three of the 12 or 13 youngest players in the whole draft class are all on the same team. So, uh, cornerback and Libra, uh, Martin Emerson was born on the 27th of September 2000, uh, noted Virgo, and uh, defensive end Alex Wright from UAB, September the 5th, 2000. And when you look at sort of the rest of this rookie class, right, um, a bunch of them, David Bell, right, December 14th, 2000. So three 21-year-olds were their first players that they took. Uh, not a coincidence. But I think the rookie that had the greatest impact, actually, uh, at least as initially, was Carry on Winfrey. So, He'll be joining Taven Bryant, Jordan Elliott, and Tommy Togiai. I think before the season's over, he ends up snapping with, in terms of number of snaps played, maybe not snapping with them. They also brought in some depth at the running back position, Jerome Ford, right, the former Alabama player, finds his way to, to uh, Cincinnati, had a very solid career there. Uh, good speed, good acceleration. Um, there was a Vikings running back from the late, 90s that reminds me of it. I can't remember the name now. But he's the, the perfect size. I think he's friends a little bit of, and unfortunately, Orleans Aqua never became the player I think he might have been if not for injuries. But he reminds me a little bit of or Orleans Aqua. Good straight line speed, good vision, uh, better power than you might think. And I think he's got a chance to contribute early as well. Isaiah Thomas, I think, finds his way into the mix as one of the pass rushers. Uh, Michael Woods is pound for pound one of the best blocking wide receivers I've seen in years. And they finish up with Dawson Deaton, who is well into my, my top 300. Uh, he's a player that I thought was a bit of a steal even in round seven. I wouldn't have been shocked if I took him in round six. So, and let me not forget, Cade York, uh, their pick 124, is one of the better place kickers. He has a chance to make the team as well. So I think that probably all but maybe two of the picks end up contributing pretty quickly. I think some of those guys are new practice squad guys, but I think Winfrey, Bell, Wright, and Emerson contribute early and often. I think Ford finds his way somewhere into the back end of the running back rotation. I think Dawson Deaton is a guy that probably uh, you know plays a little bit, but mostly as a backup, maybe at all three, but definitely at a couple of the offensive line positions. And like I said, Cade York is a guy who's got, you know, I think at least a 50 50 chance of making it contributing. So, to dig a tiny bit deeper, I really am interested by what will happen and what could happen 
uh, with some of their undrafted free agents. I really do like their undrafted free agent class, and I want to go through some of them as well. And I'm a big fan of some of them, and a slightly smaller fan of others, but uh, be that as it may. So I'll roll through. Uh, they brought in a total of a dozen, really. I mean, that's not, not a small number. And of the, the dozen or so they brought in, some of them I truly think have a chance to uh, to start contributing and contributing, like I said, earlier rather than later. Uh, D'Anthony Bell is a safety from West Florida. I, I don't know if he makes the team. He's also a special teamer. Gene Fox, the corner from Delta State, I really like. I don't know if he makes this team again. If he does, not be special teams, but I think down the road he could become a real contributor player. Guys who I think have a chance to maybe see the field in certain situations beyond just special teams. Well, Mike Harley, uh, of course, had a great career at Miami. All-time leader, actually grew in career reception. 182 receptions, breaking Reggie Wayne's, Reggie Wayne's record, so that goes back fast. Uh, single game record of 13 receptions in a game. And also the leading receiver from Washington State, uh, Travell Harris makes it there too. He's another guy that I'm not sure if he makes the team. A guy I think does make the team is Brock Hoffman. Guard, center from Virginia Tech. Testing numbers are meh, but he's a tough guy. He's a smart guy. I think he's a guy that offensive line has to fall in love with. And here's the guys I really think. These are guys that if I had to put money on them contributing among undrafted free agents. I'm starting my get my guy my, my guy. I am a big Sean Jolly guy. So I'm gonna apologize ahead of time. I, my bias is going to show here. Partially because I was an inside defense back myself, uh, so I have a bit of a, a bias, but just look at his tape, right? Um, not the biggest guy, 5'8 and 3 quarters, 129 pounds, but feisty, smart, tough, aggressive. Um, two picks for 200 touchdowns in 2019. Tremendous ball skills, 25 passes defended, two forced fumbles in his career. And like I said, I agree, he's not the biggest guy, but he's just tough, he's aggressive. He's 4'5, 340, which is still fast enough. Vertical 36 and a half, which allows him to play more like 5'10 and a half. Um, 10 and a quarter broad, short total of 413, and a really nice three count of 695. I think Silas Kelly, I don't know why people don't like him more. I don't know. He's tested well, he's productive, he's got good size. 6'3 and a half, right? That's good size. 229 pounds. I, I, my notes on him is a very poor man's Chad Green, though. 23 bench reps, 38 and a half inches of. Uh, Vertical, 10, 2 in the broad, 4, uh, 4, 7 in the short total, and a 3 cone of 7, 4, 6. That's the only number he doesn't try to chase that 3 cone, but uh, he was first team all conference last year and has made all conference four of his six years. He has a super senior, uh, but he led the Tampa Careers, right? The, uh, the, what, the mullet um, militia, right? Uh, third in the Sun Belt in the total tackles, 96. Averaged eight per game. And also had eight tackles for loss for the season, two and a half sacks, and a tremendous, I mean, like, Fork Center top 10 interception versus South Alabama. So he's got really good body control and ball skills to go with all this stuff. His 69 tackles in uh, conference play was second in the conference. And amongst the guys who are in the top eight in tackles, he's the one with the most sacks. I think he's picked for special teams at least and perhaps more. And now, to me, the jewel of the crown of the undrafted free agent class for them is Isaiah Weston from Northern Iowa. Big guy, right? 60 and a half, 214, 44240. Very productive, right? 22.64 yards per catch in his career. Uh, also tough. And though he's not always great at blocking, he's occasionally great at blocking. And the fact he's occasionally great at blocking means he could be a great blocker more. I think he just asked to do it more often. Missed 2018 with, a, with an ACL, but bounced back. Played really well in 2019, had an amazing year, uh, 1,053 yards on a team that doesn't throw the ball crazy all that well or that often. But uh, 43 receptions that year and gross 12 starts. Um, set a school record for touchdowns with seven consecutive games with a receiving touchdown. Missed some time in the sh uh, shortened 2021 season. Still seven catches, 150 yards, 21.7 yards per catch, and once again, another touchdown in the game. And then bounced back big time last year, 23.9 yards per catch, second team all-conference, and of course he and Weston, I mean, think about the, the receivers they had down there in the Missouri Valley Conference. Um, I mean, not Weston, he, he and Watson, Watson Weston, right, the W. But 37 catches, 883 yards, five touchdowns, and 12 starts. And I think even though he's, you know, he's been around a little bit, I think he's really still just needing to scratch the surface of his talent. 
Last but not least, uh, kids with salary cap. Who doesn't love talking about the salary cap? And they've currently got a usage phrase in the contract. A lot of things will have to happen. Obviously, the elephant in the room is Baker Mayfield with his 18.858 million, so almost 19 million in in cap hit. Uh, and since they haven't managed to move him, even if they had moved him, still gets cap hit. So. They're going to ride it out for a while. We'll see what happens. Austin Hooper is next with cap number of $13.25 million. Then comes Miles Garrett, a bargain really price, uh, at 12, uh, under 13, right? $12,961,120 in cap. Zach Conklin's an $11 million cap hit. David Joku, surprisingly, is like the fifth largest cap number on the team, $10,931,000. And then comes to Sean Watson. Now, this is some funny, you know, funny money, funny business with his number. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, at least for this season, he's only getting one million thirty-five thousand dollars in guaranteed money. There's only ten million and twenty-eight thousand with the cap, and then John Johnson is next, four million in guaranteed money, seven and seven point seven and three-quarter million with the cap, and last but most of the top dollar guys. I think it's two more actually. Bill Petonio checks in at uh, a little over three million in guaranteed money, three million fifty-eight thousand and eight hundred twenty-four dollars. Six hundred, sorry, six million, six hundred fifty-eight thousand and eight hundred twenty-four dollars against the cap, and then Kareem Hunt, zero in guaranteed money, but he's six million two hundred fifty thousand dollars against the cap because of a combination of both a base salary and uh, and prorated bonus. But Nick Chubb, still a bargain, right? He's only getting um, uh, one point two one three million. And his cap number is a little over five million, so they've got some decisions to make too. And then Jedrick Willis is also around that same number, a um, little bit more in guaranteed money, two point four million in guarantee. But so they've got, a, with the exception of a couple of sort of large whale sort of towards the top end, most of their their situation is pretty good. Their dead cap is tied up in Damian County County at three point six million, Troy Hill at two point six two five million, Case Keenum at two and a third million, and Malik Jackson, 1.893 million, 750,000. Casey Treader is 1.625 million, and Jarvis Landry is just one and a half million against the cap, dead money. Anthony Walker is 1.963 million against the cap, dead money, and then Shells at Redline is $180,102 with the cap. So it's a little over 15, 15 million, 23,000, uh, and $55 of dead cap money. So they've still got um, you know, with their $216,743,082 in, in cap liability, uh, they still have $27,352,120 in cap space right now today. Now, that's something that's going to change because they're going to just, you know, sign some people to some more deals. But that still puts them in a very powerful position. The team went 8-9 and nine with a lot of things going wrong for them last year. I know it's somewhat popular to sort of figure that this team's going to be a dysfunctional mess. I'm not so sure. If I'm the Ravens, if I'm the Bengals, and of course, obviously, I'm the Steelers, who I don't think, I think the Steelers are going to be on the bottom of the AFC North, which I hate to say it, uh, but this is going to be a very competitive group of teams, and the Browns are going to be better, I believe, than people think. So, we'll be picking up with the next team next.